Welcome back. Sergio Fernandez de Cordova began his entrepreneurial career at the age of 12 by starting a newspaper with his mother in New Jersey. Today, he's also a successful investor, innovator, and philanthropist, and a member of the United Nations Foundation. He joins us from the UN, and also with us from New York, is a founder and president of Wellbeing Foundation Africa, Toyen Saraki. For the past two decades, she's focused on maternal and child health, ending gender bias, discrimination, and violence, and improving education and the lives of people in Africa. Sergio, let's talk about sustainable development goals. I have some of these goals in front of me. No poverty, zero hunger, good health, well-being, good education, gender equality. China has really led the effort in this department. It was the first to submit to the UN its national plan for implementation for the 2030 agenda. China's Premier Li Keqiang spoke at the UN. He told the UN General Assembly um, the current refugee crisis, poverty and conflict all could be attributed to insufficient development, insufficient development. What is your take on it, Sergio? Well, I think, you know, um, uh, for my take as an entrepreneur, I think that the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda is an incredible opportunity. It's not just for uh, entrepreneurs themselves, but I mean, when you look at, you know, countries like China, where there's now a framework by which to create development opportunities, to create better policy making, to have a standardized, agreed upon, like COP21, a framework that allows them to really, you know, change the conversation locally and therefore impact the world internationally. Uh, Toyen, what are the challenges facing women across Africa in terms of their everyday lives? Well, definitely in Africa, I would say to you, the women are not as highly valued as men. You know, it starts from birth. As a girl child, they're already probably saying sorry to your father and saying, you know, all the money you invest on her education is going to go to somebody else's family. But we know that this is not true. Women are nurturers, women are carers, and the most important investment that you can make is to invest in the education of a girl's life to give her the opportunity and give her rights, you know, we, we need to have our rights assured. In Nigeria, we're currently struggling, actually, we're fighting to get the gender equality and opportunity bill passed. And I believe that this was actually initially rejected because of um, an ambivalence or even a fight back to the idea of women owning property, property rights and inheritance rights. But we're working on it. I have um, convened a stakeholders forum to support the gender equality and opportunities bill, and it's getting a second chance at the Senate next week. We really cannot develop if we leave half of the world behind, and the female gender is half of the world. We need that investment now. What about progress? Has there been significant progress in Africa and especially in Nigeria when it comes to gender equality in the last 10, 15 years? Well, it really depends on how you measure the progress. If you're going to be measuring the progress politically, I would say we've had a slight downturn because we've gone down from 12% representation in political positions to just 6% at the current time. But there has been progress that has been made with pockets of excellence. In Kwara State, for instance, there's a 15% female representation and political era. But women are making progress themselves as individuals. And this is what we need to create a better connect to government to make sure that this progress registers across the board. I think where it comes to education, most definitely, most Africans now recognize that a girl has an equal right to education with a man or a boy, but poverty is still going to be the one thing that holds us back. And then when you come to the issue of migration and displacement, that knows no gender. Women and children suffer the most in conflict, but the suffering is pretty strong across the board. We're going to need to strengthen basic systems to be able to build the resilience to cope with crisis and with conflict. You mentioned education, gender equality, poverty, all parts of sustainable development goals. Sergio, some of these goals appear to be highly ambitious. How realistic, how doable are these, especially for Latin America? In places like Venezuela, Sergio, where people can't even find basic goods, they can't even find food. 
Well, I think that when you're, when you're looking at, you know, how doable are they, I think that, you know, although they're, they're broad and lofty, I think it, it really goes down to each of the independent economies. I mean, what's exciting about in Latin America is that there's a real opportunity. We just hosted a big summit at the UN of, of Latin leaders and to talk about how we're implementing the sustainable development agenda in Latin America and now Cuba really becoming a, a, an incredible opportunity as well as obviously Venezuela really, you know, uh, um, there obviously a lot of reform needs to happen there, but you know, the opportunity within the framework of the SDGs in Latin America is something that we're very excited about because it's, it's, they're not that far behind. And I think that the culture in Latin America really lends itself to an SDG framework, and it is something that is a, a very much embedded in the DNA. It's just a matter of really measuring and, and really and executing and, and really bringing the programs together. Toy, and let's talk about those young girls who were tragically abducted by Boko Haram, the Chibok schoolgirls in 2014. 200, more than 200 are still missing. Dozens managed to escape. You recently wrote a very passionate article saying, sadly, the Chibuk situation is nothing new. Seldom throughout history has armed mobilization not been weaponized to victimize women. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? You know, this is the truth. Wherever you see war or conflict anywhere in the world, Women and children bear the brunt of the suffering. Women have always been used as the chattels, the bargaining tools. And this is a crime against humanity. These girls were at school because they were doing their exams. Their parents had made the investment in sending them to school in an area that is not that well resourced or rich because they wanted them to have a better life and the route to that better life was through education. And just the thought that somebody somewhere with an abhorrent ideology would grab the girls, take them, and use them to hold an entire country, in fact, to hold humanity hostage, it's just awful, but we will never stop looking for them, and we will look for them until we find them. But it's happening all over the world. It's happening in Syria. It's happened in every country where there's conflict. You know, if you recall the Yazidi situation, again, it was the women and the girls. And this is something that has to stop. It's a crime against humanity, and I hope that we're going to be able to treat it against a crime against humanity. It's just not right. Sergio, you've spoken about business development in emerging countries. Is there a magic formula here to be able to achieve sustainable development goals that we've been talking about, whether you're in Nigeria or whether you're in Venezuela? Yes, I think there is. I think that, you know, the, a lot of the, I'm, I'm a huge fan of public-private partnerships, and I think that there is a formula. It's just that we need to start to invest in it. And, and the biggest problem with the markets is that if no one is doing it and no one is leading the way, then we don't have examples to go off of. And, you know, we're very passionate personally. You know, we have a fund in Mexico where we're looking at eradicating poverty vis-a-vis -vis investing in the community and creating at least, you know, single-digit returns, but being able to do that. And, you know, you have to, you know, show these examples. You know, I spoke at the UNCTAD 14 conference in Kenya, and, and at that conference we had a keynote panel where I was a younger sort of member of the panel talking about innovative public-private partnerships and why it's important, A, to have the private sector involved in every conversation, B, to have the public sector governance policy framework, uh, C, to have make sure that we have the NGOs, the social impact leaders, and D, to have the people, civic society, because if we're not doing this to service the people, help the people, and, and develop platforms that are creating a better world for them, then, you know, we're not doing our job at, from an investment all the way from governance all the way to social impact. And I think that, you know, this, you know, today we look at it as something that's innovative, but, you know, to me, in my, in my eyes, it's like it's common sense. If what, How are we not doing this and how are we not implementing it and how are we not replicating it? And, you know, some of the work that we do with the SDG fund as well is, is looking at that framework, creating this sort of GP for the LPs to be able to plug in. The general partners create the framework, the document, the paper that allows then a limited partner to come in and actually take a chance at an opportunity. And I think, we, again, you know, we're in year one. I think this is, a, you know, a long road and it's a 15-year journey, but it's an opportunity 
to really showcase examples. And I think from the UN's perspective, I think the responsibility is to really showcase these examples, to show these ideas, to elevate these so that they could, others could actually also replicate them in country, in region, and, and, and help you know, facilitate and accelerate the Sustainable Development Goal agenda. Toyin, let me um, switch gears and talk a little bit more about something uh, very personal, uh, something that happened to you. You've been open about sharing your heartbreak, uh, losing one of your twins at birth in Nigeria. Um, could that have been prevented? Talk to us about Nigeria's public health care system and how did that tragic loss shape your advocacy on behalf of other women? You know, I think it could have been prevented 100%. I was seven months pregnant and I delivered in a pretty good hospital, but they didn't have my records and I arrived there in a crisis and the anesthetic just um, didn't get there in time. So I had one stillbirth and I had one premature child, a 28 weeker. I had to fight for my life and I had to fight for my child's life. And part of that fight was getting the right information, the right medication and the right techniques to bear on my situation. Now there were good points that came out of that. I received fantastic care from the medical personnel and very compassionate care from the midwives, which really, really helped, you know, not just my physical health, but also my mental health. But when I came out of it, when I came out on the other side, I was filled with um, a sense of outrage and realization that what happened to me was an everyday occurrence for hundreds and thousands of women in my country. We lose about 800,000 women a year in childbirth and an equal number of children. That's 1.6 million lives lost every year that is preventable. And it's preventable by simple things. It's having trained medical personnel to meet you at your point of need in a well-equipped medical facility that has all the right tools and medications and records, a history of what you've been through so that they know what to do to you or can even predict what you need in advance. And that's why I started the Wellbeing Foundation in 2004. So the Wellbeing Foundation initially started by helping with access to healthcare. We were literally paying people's hospital bills. And that evolved into a universal healthcare access fund where we partnered with a community health insurance scheme to pay capacitation fees so that patients could actually have a full insurance package of care. But I feel very, very strongly that we need to support health workers. And that is why I accepted the role as Global Goodwill Ambassador to the International Confederation of Midwives, which promotes the midwifery services framework which is centered around the SDGs around the world. We have reached 125,000 women and the proof is in the pudding. We have not lost one single one of our mothers or newborns that have attended our classes. In the facilities where we have put our Emonk trained midwives, they haven't lost a single life either, which is a complete variance to the national mortality figures. Tremendous achievements. We so appreciate both of you, Toy and you, Thanks. for opening your heart, talking about your personal pain as well. Sergio to you as well. Sergio Fernandez de Cordova, Toyan Saraki, thank you to you both.